because I'm taking in all this news that I'm not getting too impacted emotionally because it's, these are just really uncertain times and rightfully so we should all feel concerned about not just our health you know do we go outside when the, these cities and states start to open up i don't know if you saw the pictures of the people in uh wisconsin at this bar uh you know on top of each other and drinking and i'm saying you know what i'm sorry it, it, everything isn't about race but i was so glad that that was not a bar for african-american people breathing on each other like that thinking mm -hmm. oh my god you know how dangerous is this conduct so uh, as we try to navigate what to do on the public health side, obviously we have this huge, you know, hole that's been blown into the economy. And, you know, I, I'm sure most of you like me didn't buy into, you know, Trump's rhetoric that this is the best economy ever. No, it wasn't. An economy had a lot of issues, particularly for middle class and, you know, working families, but it was obviously a much different economy eight weeks ago than the economy that we all face today because of COVID-19. And uh, the economist uh, Martha Gimbel that I had on the show yesterday talked about how long it's going to take. And no, there is no magic bullet, despite all the happy talk from the White House, uh, third quarter, fourth quarter, next year, we will not see a booming US economy. Uh, the, the biggest thing she says we can hope for is that the bottom doesn't continue to fall out and we just don't see mass devastation across almost every industry. So I think that's the backdrop in which we have this conversation. So as everybody's trying to figure out what to do, uh, you know, it is with the backdrop knowing that the economy is going to take some time. Now, obviously there's some industries, if you're in the grocery industry or, you know, you own stock in, in some of those big box stores like Costco's or, or Walmart, obviously those stores are doing incredibly well. Grocery prices are in some communities almost double. Uh, uh, but unless you're delivering those groceries or selling those groceries, uh, you know, you, you may be, or you're likely to be in an industry that's been pretty hard hit uh, by COVID-19. And if not now, you know, the, the future, you, you're not likely to be immune from it. None of us are going to be immune from what's happening in the economy. So I'm going to just go, I'm going to start by uh, trying to respond to the questions that were sent to me and feel free to uh, I know someone on the call is, is managing the questions, you know, so feel free to interject with questions because it doesn't have to be linear. I don't have to go through all the questions. We can, I can answer a question and we can stop and have a conversation. Uh, so the first question was, is this a good time to launch uh, your own business? And I would say absolutely yes. And I would say uh, I've always been a firm believer in multiple sources of income. I myself, even though I, uh, I'm a civil rights attorney by training, and I own a law firm, I, I run a nonprofit, but I, I've always had multiple streams of income probably for at least the last 10 or 15 years. And I strongly encourage people to do that. And the types of businesses that I think, you know, are, are the most uh, realistic and probably the most valuable and profitable at this time is anything that happens online because people are at home uh, and if you live in California, or you, particularly if you live in LA County, we've been told that our shelter in place order will continue indefinitely uh, and that there won't be large crowds or big groups. Uh, and that includes big office groups, people going back into big offices uh, at least until the end of the year, if not next year. So I would strongly encourage people to think about home-based businesses and what kind of uh, home-based business you can launch. There are obviously lots of benefits. You know, you get to write off things with home-based businesses like home offices and cell phones and other things that, that you use. Uh, there's an economic uh, financial expert that I have on my show a lot. Her name is Lynn Richardson. Uh, and Lynn has a webinar called The Symphony. And she is a big proponent of having uh, online businesses. So I would encourage people to take a look at uh, Lynn's webinar uh, for suggestions and ideas about, you know, possible home-based businesses. And there's everything from uh, tutoring to, you know, selling products online to be, being a personal assistant for someone. I mean, you name it, it's pretty much happening online, writing content, uh, ghost writing. Uh, I mean, there, there's just so many things, uh, teaching actually, you know, the masterclass. Uh, there are also all these apps now that allow you to do an online course and charge for that online course. So if you wanna teach somebody how to use Zoom or 
you know, how to use an Excel spreadsheet or how to bake cookies, vegan cookies. You can, you know, whatever your passion is, whatever your skill set is, whatever your lived experiences are, uh, you can convert that into cash and you can do it from the comfort of your own home. Uh, like we are doing here and like pretty much the rest of the world, you know, everybody's doing something that's uh, web-based or virtual. So my answer to that question is categorically, yes. I think this is a great time to launch a business and you can do it uh, without having to worry about rent and some of the other things that may have been cost prohibitive for you uh, prior to COVID-19. So the next question is, should we continue in corporate America and work on our business on the side until this settles and we are back to quote unquote normal. So first thing is there's not going to be any normal. I mean, everything that we thought was going to be is not going to be. And your governor, Governor Cuomo, who you know is much watched TV for even us across the country, uh, you know, he makes that plain and clear every day. There is not going to be a normal. And for good reasons, he says, let's not go back to normal. Let's go back to better. So let's make those systems that weren't working, let's make them work better for you know, different disenfranchised people, for poor people, for working people, for minority communities. Uh, but more importantly, if you follow this closely, even things like office buildings, you know, Twitter said, you don't even have to come back into an office ever. Other big companies have said at the earliest, at the end of the year, I have a good friend uh, who works at BlackRock uh, and he told me his BlackRock is telling folks, come back if you're comfortable come in a couple of days a week, but really you don't have to. And I think that's mm. going to be, and the reason that's going to, I mean, there are lots of reasons. One, the public health issue, large crowds, uh, super spreaders, those meetings where people go have been determined to be, you know, a place where the virus spreads very quickly. Uh, so we know that that's uh, problematic uh, in terms of trying to keep the spread down. So people going into large uh, offices is just not likely uh, to happen. So. I think that the new normal, you know, we're going to have to, we don't know what it's going to look like, but we know it won't look like uh, what, you know, we have today or what we left when we left. If you had a corporate job, I'm sure your corporate job today looks very different. Lots of uh, companies are realizing too that people are as productive, if not more productive at home. So why continue in some, you know, massive commercial lease if your staff can Zoom, if your staff can go to Google Hangouts, if your staff can, you know, do all of these meetups that are happening online and be equally productive and you don't have to worry about the liability because that's the other big issue that's looming uh, despite even over the next budget is about the GOP saying these big companies need protection from liability. And of course, you know, the consumer rights lawyers and the unions are pushing back saying, no, you can't immunize these big companies from liability because nobody would adhere to any safety uh, precautions or protocols. But that's gonna be a big battle and a lot of big companies aren't gonna be willing to get caught in that battle or to bear that responsibility. So they're gonna just say, stay at home. And particularly if you're productive, you know, they get to save money. Uh, our law firm, we were looking at, we pay $5,000 a month just for people to park a car. So instantly you can cut $5,000 out of your budget and you guys in New York, you know, that, that could be fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 for the same number of cars, given how expensive parking is. So expenses like that, businesses are gonna be looking at and saying, if I can cut that, why not? So I would say if you're in corporate America, you're probably going to be working differently, maybe, you know, 100% at home or at least partially at home. And you have that time and that opportunity, absolutely, I think, to start a, an online business uh, while you are still performing your, you know, your job duties for whatever corporation or whatever company you work for. So, well, that's good stuff. That's good stuff. Ariva, quick question. I, can you hear me, Ariva? I just, I, I just want to pull it back from the first thing that you said. As of today. 36.5 million Americans have filed for unemployment. Let's just, let's just stop for a second and let's just try to digest that. That is alarming. That number is alarming. And tonight we have several small business owners on the phone. We have several entrepreneurs on the phone. We have several people who wish dream to be entrepreneurs. And when you hear a number, 36.5 million people have filed for unemployment. 
what does that look like? You know, and I think about this question because in your book, you, you know, Make It Rain, you talk about how to reinvent yourself. How do you make your message, change your message? Can you speak to that specifically and how we can rebrand and re-message ourselves? Well, absolutely. So you use the word re, so implicit in that is that you already have a brand or that you've already positioned positioned yourself uh, you know, in the marketplace as a, a brand and now you want to change that. So I'm not sure, is that your question? Or is the question, if you have not established yourself as a brand, how well, do you I'm, go about the steps to do that? I'm talking about looking, you know, just let me put your book up here for a second because this book is excellent. Make it rain. So rebranding, repositioning. So if someone is already that person who's been in the workforce and they're part of that 36.5 million, right? Right. That person has already started their working. Now they're out of the workforce, whether they're going to go back next month or the next two months, we really don't know. So right. can we speak to that person? Okay. I got it. And so great question, right. uh, Tracy, uh, absolutely. Yeah, that 36.5 million people is not just a, a statistic. Those are real people. Real lives have been impacted. And you're so right. A lot of those people don't know if they'll go back in a month or three months or ever. And if they go back, what that looks like. Change positions, changes in their salary, their status, so many things. And the uncertainty that they may go back for a couple of months and then be laid off because according to Dr. Bright today, we're, about, we're gonna catch hell in the fall. So this isn't even the worst of what we're going to see. Uh, so you start with what it is that you were doing on that job. What are the skills? What are the lived experiences? What are the, you know, the, the talents that you have that you were using in that job? Because those are the things that you want to start to highlight. And those are the things that you want to build around. So let's say if you were working at one of these big uh, accounting firms and uh, that accounting uh, firm, most of their clients were restaurants. You know, they did the accounting for mid-sized restaurants. And a lot of those mid-sized restaurants have been, you know, their doors have been closed for the last two months and they don't know what the, the status of that looks like. So you've been a part of a layoff because they don't know what their main client base is going to look like over the next year or so. So you now have some accounting skills. You have some excellent, you know, uh, skills that you can put to work uh, in your own business for your mm -hmm. own self. So you now have to go out. Do you have a LinkedIn account? Do you have an Instagram account? Do you have a Facebook account? Do you have a visible presence? If somebody Googles you, can they find you? Can you write an article about what's happened to the restaurant industry? What's happened to you know any industry that you, you maybe have some experience with as an accountant? Uh, writing articles is a great way to start positioning yourself as an authority, as an expert. Uh, I wrote uh, an op-ed piece for USA Today when the first stimulus package, CARES Act, before it was passed, I guess it was like number two or three, they were talking about PPP loans and giving this loans to small businesses, but there was nothing in that act that specifically uh, delineated nonprofit organizations. So I wrote an article, again, as my, with my nonprofit hat on, advocating for why the federal stimulus package and the response from the federal government needed to distinguish uh, nonprofits, those nonprofits that, you know, are really the safety net in so many communities, and we needed to have grants rather than loans. So I wrote it, it got picked up uh, by USA Today. Uh, I worked with their editor, in-house editor, uh, you know, to make some changes for to fit their format. And, you know, that article was picked up and, and got a lot of traction. So that's an easy, quick thing you can do. And it doesn't have to be published in USA Today. You know, I've written a lot, so I, I usually get picked up by big uh, publications like that. But there's so many online sites. And again, mm -hmm. if you have your own website, you have your own social media, you can post your article on your own sites. That's, you know, as, you know, that's a way for you to get your voice out there. So right. when you think about rebranding, start writing a list, you know, go old school, get your piece of paper, and write down everything that you can do every you know skill that you have every uh, you know expertise things that you're comfortable with and that you can speak to from an authentic voice uh, one thing i tell people you know so i don't know if you guys of course you have you've been following all of these instagram live pages where people you know d nice is you know club quarantine erica badu and jill scott they're doing their you know their their battle 
uh, comedians are doing things, but, but you see some people doing things that are what Dr. Phil likes to classically say is out of their lane. Mm. So I'm not a comedian. So I would look crazy going on my IG page, trying to tell jokes. You know, I, I'm, can be funny. I think at times I have a good sense of humor, but I'm not a comedian. So the last thing you want to do is start trying to mimic or copy what you see other people doing. Mm. It's not you because the social media, one thing about people on social is, you know, they have authenticity radar. So they can tell if somebody is, you know, out of their lane or doing something that's inauthentic to them. So I would start with that list and just figure out, you know, what are the skills that I have that could be valuable to someone else. And to your point, there are people who may not have a brand. They may not even know their brand. And of course, you know, you want to be authentic, you want to stay in your lane, but can you speak to that business owner or that person who that's their that's their dream and they do not have the brand yet? Right, but they, but they have something, and that's what I'm saying. You you have something. If you're a business owner, say you own a pet grooming store, so mm -hmm. you have an expertise in working with pets. Uh, maybe you're going to start a business where you, you're doing pet walking or pet sitting or something around pet care uh, for people who are stuck at home. And just like people need a break from their kids, maybe people need breaks from their pets. I don't know. Maybe they don't want to go out and take their pets for a walk. Mm -hmm. But you have something. You may not call it a brand. And people, a lot of people don't think of themselves as brand because they may think, you know, Coke is a brand or Kleenex is a brand. And those are brands. Those are big brands that we're all very familiar with. They're household names. But you have something that distinguishes you, something uh, that you know makes you unique, and something that you have that is of value. Because the fact that you had a small business or mid-sized business or any size business means that you develop some expertise in something. So I would start with that, and mm -hmm. build around that, and that becomes what you brand yourself as. That's good. That's good. Thank you. All right, I'm going to go back to my list of questions. Okay. How does one make the pivot to transition to 100% digital? Mm -hmm. And I would say to that, we've all been forced to. I mean, we had to, I had to take two businesses online. So I had to transport my entire law firm because in LA, we had like three days notice where you could not come into an office. So we had to, we had a tech person. So, you know, we were able to set everybody up with, with, you know, Zoom accounts. And uh, we had our whole practice in a cloud-based uh, system, uh, uh, litigation management system. So that wasn't as difficult, but I don't even think there's a question now of, of how the question is we've been forced to. So if you're doing anything right now, particularly if you're in a state like California or New York that hasn't opened up, you've been doing it online. So for many of us that maybe even telehealth, I'll use that as a great, uh, a great example. Uh, I have a tech company that I just started in the telehealth space. And I was talking to some potential clients about it and telehealth prior to COVID-19 was had a horrible adoption rate. So if you think back 10 years ago, before we all would bank online, you know, remember we would say, I'm not, you know, transferring my money online or people were so leery of, of you know, using online banking because of fears of, of breaches and confidentiality and hacking. And now most of us never ever want to walk into a bank again in life. We do all of our transactions online. So telehealth was the same way pre-COVID-19, although a lot of doctors offered telehealth, the adoption rate was under 10% for most medical practices. People just weren't comfortable. And now all of a sudden we have to, uh, you know, if you want to talk to your doctor, in most cases, you're doing it by Zoom, you're doing it by FaceTime, you're doing it telephonically. So one thing, one outcome of this, this outbreak is probably telehealth adoption rates have soared. And the predictions are that even after the outbreak, probably 40 or 50 percent of all medical appointments will happen, uh, you know, virtually. So don't, don't think about how to make the transition as much as well. Don't think about, you know, can you make the transition? The question is, how do you do it? And you just got to jump in. You got to get, you know, technical assistance. And sometimes that technical assistance can come from that 12-year-old or that 16-year-old that lives with you because they tend to, you know, they, they adapt, adapt so quickly to these uh, different virtual platforms. Uh, so, and again, there's a YouTube station for everything. Uh, I was on a Zoom call yesterday and someone asked me, 
They said, can you annotate the call? And I didn't know what she meant by annotate. So of course I went to YouTube and found a whole video on, you know, how do you annotate on Zoom? It's basically when you're sharing your screen or you can, you know, somebody's sharing something, you share your whiteboard and you can write on it. But within three minutes, I was like, okay, I'm an expert now on how to annotate on Zoom. So there's really no reason you can't learn how to do everything you need to do virtually because the resources, and they're free. I mean, you, can, you don't even have to pay anyone. You may have to get to that point where you do need an expert, but a lot of this is free. Right, right, uh, right. And in chapter three, I think this is really interesting. I'm just listening to you right now. You talk about find your people. Find your people. I don't know if we really practice that. And that's that's free, finding people that think like you, that um, perhaps um, may be people to align yourself with. But how do you find your people? A lot of it's trial and error. So, uh, and a lot of it's gonna come about by the content that you post. So finding your people is really about who are the people, again, I go back to my accountant, who are the people that want and need the information that you are providing as an accountant? Now your Facebook page right now may be full of just your personal family and friends and you just may be sharing stories about travel and kids and you know, cooking and funny memes. You know, may not be people that are interested in your profession or you as an expert accountant. So you've got to go out and, and search for those people. You've got to go out and join some Facebook groups where there are groups of accountants, group of, groups of small business owners. Uh, for my show on unemployment, I wanted to find someone that was stuck in that, that, that middle ground because they had an LLC and they were independent contractor and they also had some W-2 income. And there's a, a weird kind of trap that they're in with these new unemployment benefits. So my producer went and found on Facebook, there's a Facebook page of producers and people that work behind the scenes in Hollywood, 70,000 people. They're all, you know, either laid off or, you know, somehow have lost income because their productions have been uh, uh, shut down. But most of them are the exact people that we were looking for. They have LLC income. They have some W-2 income. We found Carrie. Carrie was a guest. Bam. That happened in like 24 hours. Mm -hmm. So you just have to like I said, start on Facebook. Who are the people that you're trying to connect with? And you do some research and you find groups and you join those groups and you start entering those conversations, posting, talking to, responding, engaging with those, those people. Uh, and you can ask people, you know, are, are you interested? I, you know, I've been an accountant for 20 years. I've just transitioned from my big firm. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm going, going to be giving some advice on you know, how to file your taxes for 2020 uh, because of COVID-19. Is this something that you'd be interested in? Do you know five other people that maybe want some information about how to file their taxes for 2020? I'm gonna write an article or maybe I'm gonna do a Q&A session uh, on my page. If you, you know, can you invite five people to come onto this page? I'm gonna talk about filing your taxes post COVID-19. Okay. And you talk about starting big, start big and write down your thoughts and, and, and what it is that you're pitching about yourself or you want people to know about yourself. And I think sometimes we don't really trust ourselves or believe in ourselves enough to think big and start big. Absolutely. So that's imposter syndrome. And we have all heard it. We've all talked about it. We know that African-American women in particular, we tend to probably you know, suffer from it the most and for good reason. I've been reading all these critiques of the 1619 uh, project uh, that was in the New York Times uh, and just you know, how they've come uh, after you know, the uh, journalist who wrote that, that amazing project. Uh, and I've just watched how firm she's been about the project you know, and the research and the work that she's done. But yes, we do have a tendency to think that we have to uh, play it small. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's to make other people feel comfortable because we're right. fearful that, you know, our light is going to be too bright and other people can't, you know, stand the brightness of our light. Sometimes it's because we've been told that we aren't, you know, all of that and, and that we, you know, don't have the skills that we think we have. We may have sat 10 years next to uh, a guy on a job that we know we were smarter than, but he made more <laughs> money, had more status got more recognition. And so, you know, that impacted our confidence. There's so many reasons, uh, but 
this is the season. I'd say this is your time. If, if you've been trapped in that smallness, this is your time to, to break out of that. Because one thing about COVID-19, it's made all of us equal. I mean, so I, I watch, you know, I work on, on TV, but we're all doing TV now, just like this. Mm -hmm. And you look at your favorite anchors, you know, there are some people who are cheating and they got massive staff in their, you know, homes doing hair, makeup. But a lot of us are just doing it ourselves. Right. You know, this, right. this weave star, I was looking at a picture. This weave was so long. <laughs> it was so fabulous. And this thing is chewed up, ate up. I mean, because I'm just hot pressing, you know, I'm flat ironing the, the crap out of it. And my daughter's like, mom, why don't you cut that out? I said, because what's under it is hundred times worse. <laughs> <laughs> And I don't know why this stylist of mine in eight weeks cannot find me some new hair. So actually, I'm, I'm just going to tell y'all my secret. So when you see me with some fabulous new hair, I got it from New York. My LA stylist has been so like overwhelmed with personal stuff, blah, blah, blah. So a friend of mine said, oh, Reeve, there's this stylist in New York. She does, I don't know, whoever. But, you know, hit, hit her up on Instagram. So I hit her up. She got back to me. I said, no, I'm going to wait on my L.A. girl. I said, you know, I think I'm good for now. A couple of weeks go by. I started cutting this thing. Because <laughs> one side was way longer than the other one. It's half coming out in the back. So I hit the girl back up and I said, okay, I'm ready. <laughs> and so she's like, okay, this is what you got to do. Measure your head, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. So I made my deposit. I ordered my dye. So when it comes, I cut all this out take these braids down, dye this hair, braid it back up, and I'm going to be so fly in this wig. That's what I needed. I can take it off, put it back on, because I have to run. I sweat out. No, she's, I don't want any lace. I can't glue nothing down. Can't do all <laughs> that. That's way too complicated. I just want something I can put on, take it off at night, and be good with it, because I'm you know, on camera a lot during the week. So I, I digress. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no. You digress, but I, you know what I hear? Pivot. Ladies, we need to learn how to pivot, right? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, we were talking about imposter syndrome, and I was just saying it, this great equalizer where we're all on Zoom with bad hair and mm -hmm. homemade makeup. So right. I, I think to the extent you were feeling insecure about anything, you can feel real good because some of the, the favorite people you may see that are all fabulous all the time. Unless they're cheating, you know, they are just mm. like you could be getting up, dealing with somebody got caught, like me, with a weave that they can't get out of their heads because they can't find their <laughs> hair. So <laughs> we got to make it work. You have to be able so, to pivot and make it work. Yeah. So big, think big. And now's mm -hmm. the time because, you know, the standards have changed. This is perfectly, this hair is fine for now, you know. For now, it works. This is, right. for this now. is good hair. And then my, my 85 year old, who, you know, you always have that cheerleader, she says, Your hair looks beautiful. I'm like, Okay, Auntie, whatever. This hair does not look beautiful, <laughs> but I'll take it. Uh, so yes, you're right. Think big, think big. That's 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 the name. That's of the it. Issue. That's it. That is it. And and um to that point, you know, it's um I think we also have to stop being afraid. While we're thinking, but stop being stop being afraid. Like you said, we all are learning something new. This whole virtual meeting, um all of us are sitting on a, a, a Zoom call or whatever type of call, but it's all virtual. We are all trying to figure it out. And if you sit back and wait until you have it down 100%, the ship is going to sail and you're going to miss it. No, and, and that's absolutely right. And, and fear is natural. You know, you just have mm -hmm. to embrace it. I had a guy on my show who calls himself a human potential expert. Mm. likely follow him on Instagram, really inspirational, had some great advice. And he said, take advantage of this time to level up your skills. Mm. Find a level project up. that you like and level up your skills. Don't worry about what are you going to use those skills for? Because we don't know what that may be. You know, you may right. be going back into a job. You may be going into your own uh, a virtual business but if you take advantage of this time to learn a new skill or take some skill that you already have and improve it, uh, this is the time to do that. One, you'll feel gratified 
-hmm. Two, you'll feel like you took advantage of this time to do something for yourself, you know, some self-care, self, you know, improvement. Uh, mm -hmm. And at the same time, you'll be armed with a new skill set for whatever opportunity will come your way, uh, you know, six months from now, 12 months from now, 18 months from now. Right, right. And you know, I just, um, I see another question here. And this is for the business owner who perhaps cannot afford to change their office or change the workplace to, um, or they're, they're, let's just say that um, their funding is, um, is tight. So now they're faced with having to change that office space to accommodate, I call it people distancing. I know it's social distancing, but I call it people distancing. Right. That's really what it is. Mm -hmm. So can you speak to how do you structure, how do you make the change when your, you know, your pocketbook, your dollars do not mirror what you've got to do? That's going to be really challenging. And we've been talking a lot. I've been talking to some experts about that and particularly small businesses that, you know, I talked to a restaurant owner. He owns a, a restaurant called uh, Lois the Pie Queen. 69 mm -hmm. years in business. Wow. The must go to, maybe it's like your Sylvia's or it's like your Red Rooster, but mm. it's the spot in Oakland called Lois the Pie Queen. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's third generation, but it's 69, 67, 69 years, this restaurant. And he said, quite frankly, he's mm -hmm. not going to be able to function in a world where it's 50% occupancy or he has right. to take out 50% of his tables. He said, this whole takeout is not his business model. His, you know, he's a, it's a hot spot. It's where people come. It's where all the celebrities come. It's where, you know, the tourists come. Right. So I don't have an answer for that. Uh, you know, I hope in this next stimulus, pack, and, well, let me say this. The PPP loan, there's now some efforts to change the percentages so that business owners can spend more of that money on things like that. If they have to reconfigure their businesses or uh, rents and, and other things that uh, right now it's it's 25 percent rent and utility and 75 percent payroll and a lot of businesses are saying that's not that's that's strapping me that that doesn't make good economic sense i need to use that money differently so one i, I hope that happens where that money that small businesses got they can use it differently and then two there's supposed to be some additional money made available uh, in this next, uh, you know, relief package. So maybe those monies will be un unfettered, unencumbered, and, and businesses will be able to use them for things like construction or, you know, transforming their businesses to meet what are going to be the new guidelines that a lot of states and uh, local governments will impose on them. Wow. But I think that's an excellent question. Probably people should be writing to their Congress people saying, mm. look, you know, as a small business owner, in order for me to come back safely, I need resources to, you know, reconfigure my physical space. Well, thank you. We're um, actually uh, preparing questions from our participants. And as we um, start to look for these questions, we know that um, there seem to uh, be uh, several, several questions. While we're waiting for them. I have you enough on your list. You want me to do that one while you're getting yours? Yeah, I just wanted to talk to you about the credit score because I think we we all know as business owners, right? As business owners or just at, just individually, we just know that our credit score is very important. And at this time, your credit score may not mirror what you've been taught. So to that point, how important is your credit score or should we really be worrying about saving money? Uh, yes and yes. So your credit score is important to obviously everything that you do. So you want to try to preserve it uh, and, and keep it as high as you possibly can, recognizing that, again, we're in an unprecedented pandemic and financial uh, health, a financial crisis. Mm -hmm. So, you know, don't stress yourself to the point of getting sick or stressed out over it. But yes, you do want to try to preserve your credit to the extent possible. Most credit, most companies right now are not reporting into the credit bureaus they you know it's a, a moratorium on those reports right. so that people don't come out of this with jacked up credit uh and yes to stashing your cash cash is king now mm -hmm. so i tell business owners and individuals every bill that you have you should have called or should be calling every creditor that you have asking for relief uh I, with my nonprofit, we have been able to cut in half things that you would never even imagine, like group health insurance. Mm -hmm. We got Kaiser, our group health insurance, to give us about a 30% discount 
on our group health insurance. Uh, we have a big software program that we uh, use to schedule because we do a, a clinical services. We got that software uh, monthly bill because it's, it's based on the number of clinicians that we have that use it. So the bill is sky high. We got them to cut that bill in half. And initially when we asked in March, it was to go through May because we thought that's when our shelter in place order would be over. So I just told my finance guy, my nonprofit, go back and ask for August because now we've been told they say August kind of indefinitely, but the, the real date in California, in LA is August. So go to all of our creditors and get them to give us a break uh, because you'd rather have half of our money or zero money from those businesses that have closed. And we've been fortunate. We haven't had to close. We haven't had to lay anyone off. And so I've done that. I had my law firm staff do that. I had my nonprofit staff do that. And I tell people individually with your creditors, your cell phone, your utility bills, mm -hmm. everybody right now should be willing to negotiate with you some reduction so that you are able to maintain and hold on to more of your cash. And when you call them, you want to make sure, you know, you get their name, get, get it in, you know, get as much detailed as possible, get a confirmation from them that they're not going to report this to the credit bureau, get confirmation that this is not going to be deferred to some later date and you have to pick it up on the back end, but this is a true reduction uh, uh, and it's a forbearance, well, it's not a forbearance, but, mm -hmm. but it's a true reduction uh, of this bill or this invoice and you will not have to pay it on the back end. And obviously that goes for your mortgage. Uh, a lot of rent, uh, a lot of landlords uh, have been willing to strike similar deals with tenants, right. uh, but you should be negotiating with anyone you pay a regular bill to. So you need to speak up. Now is the time to speak up. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, you, you know, if there's, and again, like I said, you'd be amazed. Uh, mm -hmm. Our workers comp bills that you just wouldn't think that people would be willing. Uh, I think the reality is so they've lost so much business because people have gone under. So right. they're trying mm -hmm. to maintain something. So you'd rather get, again, 50%, 75% of a business that's still thriving or still operable than to get zero because that business, and what are they going to do? If you just say, I just cannot pay this. The courts have been closed. They really can't sue you. I mean, no, you know, nobody's going to haul you into the small claims court over, you know, some seven, eight thousand dollar bill. So they're they don't have a lot of recourse. So it's really you're in the driver's seat with this, uh, and so you should definitely be taking advantage of this to reduce your overhead as much as possible. Thank so, you for that, Layla. So I think a, we have a question from Layla questions. Sales. Yeah, before um, Layla Sales, there was one from. Uh, there's one here. Does Ms. Martin have additional resources to share for anyone who is starting from scratch? She is a resource. She mentioned Lynn Richardson as a resource. Are there any others that come to mind? Resources for branding, ideas, legal matters, etc. Good question. Let me give some thought to that and I can email Tracy some other uh experts in the area but yes there are lots of them out there no doubt about it there are a lot of people that uh like i said are doing webinars are doing uh instagram live uh they're doing facebook live they're, they're doing q's and a's they're giving a lot of resources so i'll try to put together uh some additional ones that uh we have used uh, on our show and just different people that i know uh that i can make available that would be great That'll be great. Now, now, mm -hmm. now, Ms. What, um, what was the question? And, and I apologize, Laila, am I saying it correctly? How am I saying, can we open up her yes. mic? Yes, yes, you are. You are. Let's hear it from you. What, tell us, what's your question? So I'm looking at starting a business, which is actually building a home studio inside my home. And, you know, obviously that takes a lot of capital. Do you recommend doing something if you have money to just invest all at once or taking it bit by bit by bit? Well, when you say building a home studio, you're talking about like construction, like, you know, adding on a room or what do you mean by not building? adding a room? You just need a space where you have a sound, um, you know, um, not a huge studio. It's just a space so that you can. Um, I do voiceovers. And so what's happening with the business is that now I don't have to go to auditions. I can actually do them in my home. Right. Um, and so you just need like a small space to build a soundproof, uh, but it does cost money to invest in that and buy a laptop and a microphone and all of that. 
I'm just trying to figure out, should I just kind of keep this as a long projected, like, um, well, let me ask you uh, a couple goal? of questions. Like, do you have, yeah. have one, have you made money with your voiceover business? Yes, but I wouldn't necessarily say it was a business because I was just sort of freelancing. Okay, but do um, you have do you have the belief that if you did it on a regular or more consistent basis, that there are contracts or clients or uh, companies that would hire you for these services? Yes, I've gotten people who want to hire me, but I don't have the equipment to send them the. You well, know, I think that's your answer. The, yeah, I think okay. that because that's that's my question. If you can monetize something, and you're not talking about you know, reconstruct or, or, you know, doing heavy construction, like you said, you're talking about a laptop or a computer, a microphone, maybe some kind of insulation, you know, for the sound, uh, but it doesn't sound like a, you know, a huge like construction loan type uh, investment. No, but not at all. If you can invest in uh, some equipment to create a studio that you can, you know, quickly turn around and monetize, I would absolutely encourage you to do that. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Do we miss anybody? This is the uh, this is the time. I think we said speak up. Now is the time. We have a lot of right, entrepreneurs here. Danielle, do you see any questions? I see one. There's one new message. Hold on. Okay. Okay, here's one from Ayana uh, Creighton. Thank mm -hmm. you for addressing taking advantage of relief offers. Do you recommend utilizing those savings to pay down debt, making home improvements, or keeping funds liquid in preparation for the economic repercussions of COVID-19? Yeah, all the, all the economic experts are saying stay as liquid as possible. Don't you know make any large investments? Like Laila, the investment you know seemed pretty modest. She's talking about some equipment, but no, I wouldn't take huge sums of money right now and invest in a house because uh, the housing market, you know, and sadly, is probably going to crash. <laughs> unfortunately, the experts uh, predict. So you don't want to overbuild on a house uh, that's going to be. Uh, that you know the, the neighborhood's going to lose equity. That the you know the whole housing market uh, may be depressed for several years. So I would not be making any large investments. However, deals there are deals, right? So let's say if you were planning to buy a car anyhow, uh, now car deals are you know really really aggressive. So there may be things that you were planning to do that because of COVID-19, you can do at a huge discount. So I would be looking out for those deals uh, for things that you would have otherwise done. Uh, I wouldn't you know, go out and start creating a wish list of things, uh, particularly if it's going to uh, cause you'd have to spend down a lot of your capital. I just think there's so many uncertainties right now that you wanna keep your cash uh, as liquid as possible. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Just waiting to see if there'll be another question popping in the chat or or if you want, if someone would just like to briefly unmute themselves to provide a comment or, or make a pose a question, you can do so now. Oh, here's one from uh, Kelly Higgs. With business slash side hustle, have you any experience with recouping tax savings? So I think the tax savings uh, that you would recoup are, you know, the business expenses that you get to write out off. So if you use your home for a home office, you know, there's a certain percentage of that in your taxes that you get to write off. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, equipment that you purchase. So this computer uh, that Leila will purchase becomes a, a legitimate business expense. Uh, the utility, uh, the, you know, the, the cell phone bill, uh, any of the other utilities that are used with respect to how you run that business. So there are business expenses that actually provide some tax benefits, but definitely you should talk with your accountant, your bookkeeper, you know, your tax preparer or whomever uh, to just make sure that you're taking advantage of all of those potential tax savings when you are creating this home-based business. 
Carlene, I'm gonna I'm shouting you out from an accountant because Carlene, our economic uh, development co-chair, is an accountant. Oh, really? Um, so, well, you, yes, <laughs> she does the tax preparation <laughs> and everything. So, Carlene, do you have anything to add on top of what Ariva is, is stating here? Um, no, I think she may mention as much as all in, all on par what I would say. Um, but just like it was stated, we have to just be mindful of how we're spending what we have. Because what we have right now is limited, mm -hmm. as we all know. A lot of people have lost their income, lost their livelihood, and we have to just start. When we get the desire to shop, let's go back into our closet and revisit what we have in there and, <laughs> re and revamp what we have mm -hmm. and make sure mm -hmm. that we really, really need it you know, so that we find ways, because right now during this times, we are finding ways where we wasted a lot of monies on things that we don't necessarily need to live, but we look good while we was doing it. And now you can look in your closet and you see all this clothes that looks great in the closet because you have nowhere to really go. <laughs> so, exactly. We have to like really look at that and then make a decision like, okay, I was able to get through this period of time without spending any extra, extra amount of money. Not that when this frees up, we're gonna go and spend all of our funds. We still need to spend money, but we need to be more mindful of it mm -hmm. and also be more mindful of helping our community, helping our persons of color who have the small businesses that we need to embrace and try to support more because we see so many of our small businesses out of business. Mm -hmm. The restaurants, mm -hmm. the, the groceries, the small mom and pop stores. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, we have to try to figure like, how do we go about and try to, you know, empower our own and, and build from that because in the future, whatever that future might look like, we're gonna have to be able to work within our own community to build ourselves up. Mm -hmm. so I don't know how we're going to do that. Right. So I have two, I have two questions here in the chat. First one, for first time business owners, would you briefly review the benefits of sole proprietorships versus limit, limited liability? Well, I don't know, maybe uh, Carlene may want to address that from a tax standpoint. Uh, yeah. there, from a legal standpoint, there are some liability issues uh, people incorporate typically because uh, there are limits on being able to hold someone personally liable when uh, they are organized as a corporation versus as an individual business owner. Mm -hmm. so typically, people will form some kind of limited liability corporation or some kind of uh, uh, you know, S corporation for the purposes of limiting any personal liability if they're sued. Uh, but there may be, and I'm not a tax expert, so I don't wanna speak to that, but there may be some tax benefits too from one form of ownership over the other. Uh, you, right. said it, you said it right on point. Um, when you're sole proprietorship, you personally could lose everything because if, you're, if you do something erroneously by error or whatever the case might be, you personally will lose everything. If you're a, sub -cor a S corporation or a LLC, only the equity of that business can go away. So you still, you have, you have something to lose, but not as much. Your whole life will be gone if you're a small, you know, personally. Okay. And, and no. just to add to that, definitely if you are in business, you gotta have insurance. And so many small business owners try to leap over, you know, those things that are important in terms of their protection. Don't do that. I advise people, uh, even if it's a small liability policy of $100,000 or mm -hmm. 300,000, uh, you'd be surprised. It's like people that don't have renter's insurance. Some, some insurances are very inexpensive, right. uh, but they're so necessary. So whether you're a small, you're a sole proprietor or, or limited liability, you must have insurance, particularly in a big state like New York and California where people are very litigious. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely wanna have uh, in, you know, that kind of protection for your business. So the questions are rolling in. So I have a couple, I have a couple more. Um, do you have any recommendations 
for sourcing clients via social media. How can an aspiring entrepreneur find a tribe that can help generate business leads? Okay, and that's a great question. So social media will help you generate business, but it's not the same relationship that you mm -hmm. have when you are buying media. Social media is not paid media. So if you want that kind of ROI where I invest $100 in advertising and then I sit there and the calls roll in and they say, oh, I saw your ad in the local newspaper. That's not how social works. Social media is all about building trust and engagement. And over time, from those relationships that you will build, with thousands and hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people around the globe, you then can see business uh, start to come into your company. But you, you're you going to go to social media to build a presence uh, more so than you would go to, if I would, have, you know, if you're starting out and you're you're in desperate need, or not desperate need, but you, you wanna, you know, ramp up your Generate. client mm -hmm. base quickly. I'm gonna tell you to consider some more uh, traditional, uh, advertising because you're going to use social media differently social media and a lot of people get frustrated and they, they go and they says well i you know i've got a facebook account and i have linkedin and nobody called me but that's not how it works what people will do think about billboards so you see a billboard you may not necessarily you know run to that company that you you saw that billboard but it's sending a message to you that, you know, that company is, is, is front of mind to you when you are thinking about buying a, a product or a car. So social media gives you that kind of credibility. Uh, and I, I, people do make money. I mean, they do get clients from social media, but it's not the direct uh, kind of one-on-one -on -one that you do when you are actually paying for more traditional advertising. Right. I was just also going to add from a social media aspect, um, besides just doing um, having a wealth of content on your social media accounts, utilize the, the tools that are on the social media accounts to have your contact information posted so people you could direct them to, their, to your website to fill out an inquiry, a business inquiry or a, a consult. So you could also capture that person's uh, contact information to use what's now being considered traditional uh, along with snail mail or newspapers, um, email blasts, you know, doing, doing the constant contact or MailChimp uh, uh, initiatives to get your messaging and latest uh, business, uh, business, uh, business things that you would be offering from your business. Um, Ariva, I have a, a very well, deep... Let me, I want to add to that yeah, too. Go ahead. Uh, mm -hmm. of why, why it's so important and uh, to have a social presence because a client that may come to you through some other source is going to go to your social media and mm -hmm. check you out on social media. Yeah. So that right. social media could be the closer for you. Mm -hmm. I've done that a hundred times. I'm going to hire somebody I go check them out on social media and that may be the deciding factor for me in terms of whether I'm going to use that person or not. So back to my weed, the woman that I bought this wig from, I went to her Instagram page and I checked out her page and the decision to send her this money, somebody I never met, have no relationship with, I'm just you know sending her money across the state was because of what I saw on her Insta page. And then she was referred to me by someone that I do know. So your social media is going to give you credibility. People are going to go there. And if they don't see much there, they may decide not to use you. So had this woman not had this Instagram account, I'd be thinking, hmm, how is she some kind of big time stylist and she doesn't have an Instagram page? Right. So I probably would not have felt that same comfort in actually hiring her. Okay. I have a very detailed two-parter question here. It starts off with, with the summation of things. Um, so my husband and I, own a small landscaping business and have concerns regarding growing our business during this pandemic. We have under 10 employees and have struggled due to the coronavirus. However, if we invested in more equipment, we could potentially take on more extensive work, thus creating more income to cover payroll and other expenses. Do you suggest that making these types of investments? So let me ask you, did you get the any of the PPP funding from the uh, CARES That's Act? the second question. So here's the sec, that's the second part to it. Um, she she adds, uh, I get, uh, D. Curry, 
I know you're on here. Um, she says, also, do you have any insight into other forms of relief for small business? They have already applied for the PPP loan through their bank and have yet to hear anything on that front. Okay. I, before you answer, Ms. Martin, I wanted to just touch on the PPP loan. So if everyone has been closely watching with the PPP loan, right now for brown and black community, the acceptance rate for the loan is not high. Um, the, the rejection rate is actually at right now about 95, 96% which has me very concerned as to whether or not going through your personal bank, if it's classified as a CDFI, a community development financial institution, um, or even some form of credit union, would that be more helpful? But you know, that's, that's another disparity that's happening right now. Um, Ms. Martin, go ahead. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna give myself a shameless plug. All of you all should be watching the special reports. We did a great show on this and we had mm -hmm. a, a guy from a bank Kansas City, his name was Theotis Walker. Forget your bank. Yep. The banks have been horrible. Chase, who was my bank, who I applied for, they sent me letters about everything under the sun. They rejected my application because I didn't complete or didn't upload a particular form. By the time they're writing me ridiculous letters, like if you got this money and you didn't deserve it, send it back. I had already been approved and funded by a nonprofit lender. The there's more money in the second CARES Act that has not been given away. Cabbage, PayPal, all your small banks, uh, credit, uni credit unions are doing these loans. It doesn't matter that you're at a bank. You can now literally go to PayPal, you can go to Cabbage, to all these online places. If you go to listen to my show from yesterday, Lynn Richardson, who was on, talks about all the different non-banking institutions that are doing these PPP loans, some of them which are approving you within 15 minutes and putting money in your account in two days. I went through uh, a list, which is a nonprofit. Uh, financing organization and they walked me through the process made sure everything was complete I was approved within like two days had money in like three days Chase denied me not once but twice because mm -hmm. of some document they said I did not submit I went to the bank had it out with the bank manager but Chase is also the bank that gave all of its private equity its big commercial clients loans mm -hmm. too so yes. the banks have been an abysmal failure, but they did do something in the second round of this money. And, and Maxine Waters, uh, I've been told, has been really responsible for a lot of this and making sure that a substantial amount of that money went into those smaller institutions, community institutions, uh, and non-traditional lending institutions. So I would tell you to reapply for your PPP at one of these non-traditional banking institutions. And then what I would tell you is because that money can right now only be used 75% payroll, 25% for rents and other uh, utilities, the money that you pay your payroll with from that money, the other income that you have coming in that you otherwise would have used for your payroll, you can now use that money to invest in that equipment. So now you get to pay your payroll and have it forgiven with the PPP, the money you otherwise would have had for your payroll, you get to buy your equipment and then you get to increase your, you know, your client base and, and the jobs that you're doing. Thank you. We have a, we have a great tip here in the comments. Um, tip, use this time to declutter and clean out that closet. Consider using an online consignment store example, threadup.com to ship your clothes, shoes, and other items and build merchandise credit for purchasing items that are necessary. Yeah, good mm -hmm. advice, excellent advice. Thank you, Kelly Higgs. Any, Any more other comments? comments? Anybody else? I'm just looking through the names. Okay, Danielle, do you, do you have anything on your end? Um, I do not see any any um, questions in the chat unless uh, those that are on here right now would like to briefly unmute themselves to speak. You're more than welcome to. We're just 
I'm just looking at the group chat right now to see if we're missing anyone. Okay. Well, I just have a couple of final comments I'd like to make. Mm -hmm. Please. Because I know one of your, uh, uh, someone on the call is gonna wrap your meeting, but the, the thing that I wanna say is, uh, the most important thing I think we can all do during this pandemic is to be gentle on ourselves. Mm. Uh, and you may not be in a business, you may not, you know, be uh, interested in starting a new business or, you know, trying to rebrand yourself or do any of that. This just may be the time that you want to be still with yourself, spend time with your family, mm. you know, work on a, a home project. It could be gardening, it could be, I saw that butter making machines are real popular right now. People are churning their own butter. People are making candles. People are getting you know, creative about the things that they are doing. And I think there's a lot of judgment right now. And sometimes people can feel like I'm not being productive enough during this time. And you know, what, what your A type personality friend does is fine. Uh, but it doesn't have to be what you do. So I just think everybody should, you know, figure out what's you know, lead, what is, you know, what are they being led to do during this time? And they should do it uh, without judgment from others. And that may be, uh, you know, starting a business or getting real active on social media, writing an article, uh, leveling up your skills as Mike Lee recommended, or just maybe sitting with yourself and just being still, but whatever it is, uh, just be gentle with yourself. Yeah. Danielle, there's one more comment that came up. Did you get a chance to see that? Oh, I About just saw it. Okay. okay. Here's a good one. Any cautionary advice for landlords who have rental properties while their tenants may be experiencing hardships, small property owners slash landlords may have a little financial setback as well. Any advice? Yeah, that's happening. It's happening all over the country uh, and different municipalities are trying to deal with it differently. Uh, LA put a moratorium on evictions uh, and it got fought and you know it's being challenged because you know the landlords say look we can't afford not to evict people who are not paying their rents. I think the best thing that landlords can do is to try to work with their own mortgage company uh, and get whatever kind of relief that you know makes sense given what their tenants are doing so that you know, they're not strapped, but the mortgage companies have been willing, most of them have indicated a willingness to work with landlords, recognizing that tenants are, in many cases, some not able to pay at all, or some are paying reduced rents. Uh, but I think that, again, back to my, one of my earlier points about this is the time when you should be talking with all of your creditors, everybody that you owe money to, everybody that you pay money to, you should be explaining what the predicament is and getting them on board because we're not going to get through this unless everybody uh, makes some accommodations for everybody else and the reality is if your tenants can't pay you you can't pay your mortgage company uh, or your, your bank and you know banks don't want wholesale for landlords to all just you know stop paying altogether so the question becomes what can you pay and some banks are working with landlords to allow them to pay reduced uh, mortgage payments again some are deferring payments uh, so, but there is some conversation that can be had with your uh, mortgage uh, company based on what you're experiencing as, uh, you know, from your renters. Okay. One more. When speaking with creditors, can you share tips on starting that conversation? Uh, yes. This person would say, I might need some extra time to pay a bill. And ideally, I would like to reduce the interest rate on my credit card as well as my mortgage. Yes, and that's a very appropriate conversation to be having. And trust me, they're not gonna, this is not, you're not gonna be their first caller with this question and with this request. They have been getting hundreds, if not thousands of people calling them, uh, having the same conversation. It's just a very honest and transparent conversation. Here's the reality. You know, I've been a good customer. I've always paid my bills, but I have been impacted by COVID-19. Either I've lost my job, I've had reduced hours, or you know, my tenants have not been paid and I want to continue to pay you and here's what I can pay you. Uh, and let's get an agreement. You wanna get the person's name. You wanna get as much of this as in writing. 
you want to ask them to either send you an email confirming it or you send them a confirming email. You want to create a paper trail uh, because quite frankly, some of those people may not be around themselves a month from now, two months from now, three months from now. So you want to document, document, document because those same companies are going through as much flux as everyone else is in this industry. Uh, I had rented a space for a big event in May uh, and had to, of course, cancel and try to get the money back. And pretty much everybody at this hotel we had worked with had been laid off. So, mm. you know, people aren't stable right now. Businesses are not stable and people that you dealt with a month from now may not be there now and may not be there a month later. So you want to get it in writing as much as possible. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, okay, here's the one. Okay. A couple of family members and friends have asked to borrow money during the pandemic. I want to help, but I'm not confident that if I loan the money, it will be returned. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm not the good, I don't know. That, you know, that's so, that's so individual. You know, some people have a rule that they don't loan any money that they can't afford to give away. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if, if I can afford, to lose $50, hey, I got $50 for you. Some people who have a lot more money maybe can afford to lose $1,000. So, hey, I got 1000 whatever your comfort level is. Uh, but, you know, when you loan money to family, you probably, chances are great that you will not see that money back. So I just tell people, loan what you're comfortable not ever seeing back. And that's not going to put a strain on your familial relationship. But right. that's the quickest way to fall out with somebody is over right. some money. Um, right. mm -hmm. Agree. I think there was another one um, about um, black owned um, businesses. Did that come through? Oh, I just saw it. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Um, this is a comment. A black owned salon near me set up a GoFundMe account for patrons to support. What I thought was really smart is that they counted 50% of the donation towards services to be redeemed upon reopening. I thought that was a great way to capture funds today for services they can't render until sometime in the future. Do you recommend struggling businesses offer discounts or the buying of such discounts for future use? Oh, absolutely. I, I, I think however you, you want to, in this you know, era, keep your loyal clients you know, loyal to you, offer them discounts, make it easy for them to use you. That's what breaks my heart about my stylist. I mean, I, it's, it, I've been with this person for years, so not to be able to patronize her during this period really breaks my heart. So yes, if you can offer people discounts, if you can say, you know, if you pay me today, the state of California, in, in fact, has said to us, if we pay our state income taxes early, they will give us a discount on those taxes in future years. Mm -hmm. We know the time value of money. It's, you know, your money is worth more today than it is tomorrow. So yes, any way that you can accelerate a payment. So if you have clients that can say, hey, pay me you know, a couple of hundred dollars now for four you know, shampoos down the road, absolutely. I think that's a brilliant idea. And I said so much so that the state is trying to incentivize us to pay our, our state income taxes early. Wow. And on that so, note, wait, we just want I, to thank you. Hold on, Tracy. Okay. I have a question on Facebook Live. We have um, oh. some people commenting. Uh, many people are saying that the Black community should be preparing to take advantage of the housing market to buy property. What can we do if we are stably employed uh, to prepare? Well, obviously, you know, we'll see what happens with the housing market. There's some predictions, and I talked to the economists about that, that, you know, the housing market is going to take a hit. And people who have good credit and who have savings, this may be the time that they want to make those kinds of investments. I advise people to talk to their investment advisor, their tax accountant, their tax advisor, uh, because, you know, purchasing property has tax implications and other uh, financial implications. So they definitely want to do so. Uh, having had consultation with those people that they, you know, trust as their financial advisors. Okay. And I have one more that was sent to me privately. This is the last one. Once the mortgage forbearance period expires, do you recommend paying the arrears, if possible, or seeking a loan modification to hold on to your liquid cash? 
And again, I'm going to tell people they need to have that conversation with their tax accountant because you know your your mortgage payment, how you pay your mortgage, the amount of your mortgage has implications for your taxes. And you want to make those decisions in a, a holistic way. You don't want to make economic decisions uh, in a vacuum. And you know a lot of that depends on your income, uh, what other deductions you may have, what other expenses you may have in any given period. Uh, and there may be some things, and uh, the accountant on the, the line, you know, probably has more information about this than I do, but there are probably going to be some changes to the tax code uh, as a result of COVID-19, and there may be tax credits that are available. I know the CARES Act, there are some tax credits that are available to small, or to businesses, uh, so there, there will probably be some additional changes to the tax code that impacts the way people uh, you know, take deductions and the kinds of deductions. We know the president wants to bring back the, uh, the restaurant, the dining out, the, you know, he keeps thinking that if people could deduct those uh, expenses, those dining expenses that, you know, they'll flood restaurants. But so far, Mitch McConnell and crew have said, nah, that's kind they of no. <laughs> so. The only thing to add to that is that they're looking at, um, you know, when they change the tax laws, a while ago where they stopped, they capped the deduction from your yes. state tax, your federal tax return for your state taxes that you paid. They're looking to repeal that in the next budget that's gonna go pass through, where now the expense that you have for your um, real estate property tax and your tax withholding for payroll, it will no longer be capped at 10,000 for your uh, federal return. So that's a plus, and if that gets through, it's going to it's going to bring back our tax return to a better level playing, like it was maybe two year, three years ago. So we have something to look forward to. Gotcha. Well, this has been this has a been awesome. really informative, informative conversation, and just a few takeaways, a few pearls. Pivot, speak up, and level up your skills, and. The final chapter is Watch It Rain. So we want to watch it rain. Ariva Martin, thank you so thank much. You and thank you Enjoy for the networking. Time with and you we all. just got to say thank you to Ginger for making it happen and making the yes. connection. So we want to say thank you, Ginger. Thank you. Madam thank President, you, Ariva. It's, 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 Good luck to awesome. all of you. Thank you very much. All right. Bye bye. Thank you.